Thanks very much, Taft, and it's really just an honor and a thrill to uh, be here and talk to you this evening about what's really one of the most marvelous stories in all of science, which is the revolution in astronomy that's really taken place from the um, technology represented by the Keck telescope and the technology that we've been able to put in place uh, with various space telescopes and how these two have worked together very, very well over the last uh, 20 years. And this is really, of course, the 20th year celebration of the collaboration between Keck and NASA. And as I'll describe, NASA has been here since the beginning. So one thing about NASA and its role in science is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration does not contain the word science in its title. S NASA does missions, it has projects, it has strategic science goals that drive its projects, but we really tend within the NASA community to understand how can any facilities such as Keck help with the space missions that NASA is involved with and is leading. So the strategic science goals that are relevant to astronomy and astrophysics, particularly as it pertains to Keck, are listed up here. To expand the scientific understanding of the Earth and the universe in which we live, and then discover how the universe works, explore how it began and evolved, and search for Earth-like planets. Then in addition, ascertain the content, origin, and evolution of our own solar system and the potential for life elsewhere. And astronomers are very clever and they can get almost anything they want to think of into one of these goals here, as I'll, uh, <laughs> as I'll describe. So what I like to regard this as is in fact a beautiful friendship that began you know, many years ago and we see here, you know, Rick and Louie at the end of Casablanca talking about the beginning of their beautiful friendship. But this is also a beautiful friendship as I see it between Keck and NASA. Because just 20 years ago, Keck 1 uh, went up in 1993, Keck 2 in 1996, and the real beginning of the Hubble Space Telescope in 1993 was the servicing mission that uh, put up the first of the corrected instruments that really mark the uh, beginning of the Hubble Space Telescope and its revolution in astronomy. And as I'll describe through the course of my talk, there's been this enormous synergy, not just with Hubble, but with many other of the NASA space missions. So how did, the, um, how did NASA get involved with Keck at all? It actually started out with the drive back in the early 90s when we only knew about the nine planets in our solar system. Um, and there was a panel that was pulled together called the TOPS panel. They made something called the TOPS report that was called Towards Other Planetary Systems and it was a report to the uh, Solar System Exploration Division and it called for first a ground-based observing program that would eventually lead to space-based efforts and the idea was to discover and study planets with masses as low as that of Uranus and Neptune, around 100 or more stars in the solar neighborhood. The defining element of the first phase of the TOPS program was to be the Keck 2 telescope. At that point, only one Keck telescope was envisioned. And that then led to the construction of Keck 2 with NASA coming in as a 1-6 partner in the overall um, observatory, a program to enhance the image sharpness by, through the development of adaptive optics, a focal plane instrumentation for studying planets and the materials around other stars, and an interferometer project using the two Keck telescopes linked together to make uh, dramatic advances in spatial and angular resolution. And I put check marks by all of these because in fact all of those did happen. We got two Keck telescopes, adaptive optics as you just heard from Taft has been a huge success. A variety of instruments are now being employed at Keck to look for uh, planets around other stars and indeed the Keck interferometer operated successfully for many years. 
So finding planets is now, of course, all the rage. When we started this back in the early 90s, there were no other planets known other than the ones in our solar system. But since the, then, in the last 20 years, it's really been an explosion of knowledge about other planetary systems. And Keck has been intimately involved in this over the entire course of the short history of exoplanet research. So the technique you've probably heard about in a variety of talks from people like Jeff Marcy, Paul Butler, Steve Vogt, John Johnson, um, all of whom have used Keck from Santa Cruz, Berkeley, Caltech, is the, what's called the stellar wobble technique. You use the Doppler shift of the motion of the, as the planet orbit its star, of course, the planet's moving around, but there's also a small reflex motion that causes the star itself to wobble back and forth. And using the high-res instrument on Keck, uh, many of the first hundred or hundred, couple of hundred planets were found in this regard. There's now about 530 planets found by this radial velocity wobble technique. It's an indirect technique, but very, very powerful. Uh, the next technique to come along was to find those planets that are lined up in just the right way, such that their edge on is seen by us, and thus the planet goes in front of the star for a couple of hours at a time, making a dip in the brightness of the, of the star itself, and you measure with great sensitivity that dip, you can then infer a great deal of information about the, about the planet itself. If you combine the, the measurement of the radius of the uh, planet from the transit with a measure of its mass from the radial velo velocity technique, you both confirm the fact that you're seeing a transit and not some other possible false positive, but you can also determine a lot of information about the, uh, about the host, about the planet. And Keck has again led the way in doing the follow-up of these transits, and there's now some 280 transiting planets known. As I'll mention, there's over 3,200 candidates, many of which are in the process of confirmation, detected by NASA's Kepler satellite. And Keck is deeply involved in the validation of those planets. And then, of course, we have more recently, as the image sharpening technologies, the adaptive optics have been developed, the direct imaging technique where you actually block out the light of the star. And here I've indicated planets B, C, and D orbiting, you know, a star that doesn't actually look like that funny colored blob. Um, that's just the remnant light that you couldn't block out all of it, but you've reduced the light from the star by a factor of probably a million to one to let the light of these planets shine through. And there are about 25 or 26 of these systems now detected via direct imaging. And these numbers change probably on a week-to-week -week basis. As we just heard this morning, three more planets got added into the, uh, to the census. So it's an enormously active field, and Keck has been heavily, heavily involved. And this is just a little graphic that shows starting in, in 1992, if you can see the data on the top, year by year, planets are getting involved in red, or mostly are the radial velocity planets. A transiting system gets added in in blue, and then more transits come in. Some imaging systems are starting to be discovered, and we just sort of keep going in that way. And you can see here transiting systems in blue, many confirmed by Keck, a huge swath of systems that are the red discoveries, many of them from Keck and HiRes. And the imaging area are shown in this graph where you see the location of the planet and astronomical units on the horizontal axis, and then the mass of the planet in Jupiter equivalent masses. Um, so many of the planets are sort of one Jupiter mass and maybe some out as far as an Earth-Sun distance, an astronomical unit. And you can see, uh, if we'd shown it again as a function of time, we're pushing down in the mass of these planets that we're finding so that we're finding things that are really super-Earths one or two times the mass of the Earth, in some cases actually planets that are even a little bit smaller than the Earth itself. And of course, where we'd really like to get to is one Earth mass in the habitable zone of, uh, 
of stars like our own sun, and we're still working towards that goal, but we're certainly much further ahead from the nine planets that then dropped down to eight planets, and now we have you know, over 800 other planets to, uh, to study. So I mentioned the Kepler project. This was launched uh, three or four years ago. The Kepler camera simply stares at this field of view, studies 150,000 stars, literally every minute of every day just steadily watching for those little dips in the uh, brightness of the star as a planet goes in front of it for a period of a couple of hours. You record that dip, you think you have a transit. Of course, there are other things that could masquerade as that, and that's where Keck comes in. And there's been a very extensive program, and uh, Taft and the observatory staff, Barbara Schaefer, have all worked very hard to accommodate NASA's needs to be looking at this particular field of sky in the summer sky for many, many nights in a row, and it's been just an enormous help to bring out everything that Kepler has been able to do for us in the field of exoplanets. So if I can make this little movie work, one of the things we find is that many of these planets are multiple systems. So this is what we call an orrery. So this was put together by Dan Fabricki, who's at Chicago, and it shows all the different multiple systems that uh, Kepler found where you don't have just one planet, but you see the transit sequentially of first one, then the other. And these are the actual sizes and orbital speeds of these planets as they go around their host stars. And we're typically finding that 10 to 20 percent of the systems are multiple, and if you correct for all the things that might make them not show up you know, to Kepler because they're slightly misaligned one to the other, Presumably many, many of the systems that are out there are multiple planetary systems, much like our own. So the characteristics that we're finding with the combination of the radial velocity work from Keck and the transit work from Kepler and other systems is a very broad range of planetary properties. You see gas giants, big ones up there like Kepler-7 and the other ones that are even bigger than Jupiter, which is the one in the top row over on, uh, on my right or your left, whatever it is. And then you start seeing smaller planets and then smaller ones and all the way down to the Earth. There's one system, Kepler-11, in the bottom row where there's six planets of those sizes, not much, only a little bit bigger than the Earth, all tucked in the, uh, inside the equivalent of the orbit of Venus in our solar system. So a lot of planets out there, gas giants, icy giants, rocky planets, super-Earths, if you will. And the incidence of these planets rises as we go to smaller sizes. And the, we're still working on putting together all the numbers from the transiting systems and the radial velocity systems. But it looks as if probably at least 25 percent of all stars, you know, normal main sequence stars, have some sort of at least rocky planet orbiting them. And if you figure that there's you know, 100 billion stars in the galaxy, that's an awful lot of uh, possible planets, pa planets that could be possible abodes for life, because some fraction of those will indeed be in the habitable zones of their host stars. So maybe between 2 and 10 percent of planetary systems out there will have rocky planets in their habitable zone. As I say, the range of properties of these planets goes from something like the mass of the Earth up to 10 or more times the size of Jupiter. Radius goes from Earth radius to Jupiter size. Interestingly, the density of the planet, because you can get both its radius from the transit, its mass from the radial velocity, you know, divide one by the other, four-thirds pi r cubed. The density of some of these planets is 0.1 where water is one, so it's like a styrofoam ball. It would float in a sufficiently large bucket of water. Or the heaviest, most dense planets are densities greater than 10, so you're talking a very rocky or, in fact, a metallic core. The orbital distances range from well inside the orbit of Mercury out to, from the imaging systems, hundreds of astronomical units and a wide range in planetary uh, temperatures. So it's really an enormously complicated and interesting zoo that we're starting to pick out. And as I say, Keck has been at the forefront of that. 
So, but these are indirect techniques, the transiting technique or the radial velocity technique, but seeing is believing and in fact Keck has been in pioneering in actually imaging planetary systems. Uh, so this is uh, H.R. 8799 that Christian Marois, Bruce McIntosh and others were involved in blocking out the light of the star, the remnant light from the star is shown there at the center and you can see four planets in this case, B, C, D and E. These are young planets that are still giving off radiation from their initial formation and contraction so we see them in the near infrared and these are a few t um, times the mass of Jupiter. There's no direct way to measure their mass so we have to infer it and one of the ways that we're learning about the properties of these planets is we use Keck and its OSIRIS instrument that works in conjunction with the adaptive optics to actually get a very detailed spectrum of the emission, at least in this case, of uh, planet C. And you can see the, uh, the black line are the data, the green line is uh, a model, and we have emission from water. There's water present in the atmosphere of this. There's uh, carbon monoxide, maybe some hints of methane. And from studying the atmospheric composition, we start to get ideas about how the planet itself was formed. Did it form like we believe the planets in our own solar system formed by a rocky core forming first and then gathering gas from the surrounding disk of which the star itself is being formed and building up gas through gravitational attraction is one technique. Another technique is just another fragment of gas collapsing and that we call the gravitational instability technique. We think most of these planets are forming via core accretion, not gravitational instability and the theoreticians of course are backing both horses and they'll be right no matter what happens but we try to confront them with a little bit of data every once in a while and spectra like this taken uh, with Keck are enormously powerful in trying to characterize the physical properties of these young planets. Um, but the question that NASA is very interested in, you saw from my first slide, one of NASA's goals is to directly image Earth-like planets. Earth is inside that little yellow dot in the, the equivalent of an Earth's orbit at one astronomical unit and it's another factor of a 10,000 or 10 to the fifth fainter than the planets shown here. So there's yet another whole level of technological challenge that we think probably in the end has to be answered uh, from space. But what we're doing now is certainly a first step along the way. One of the problems with finding planets like the Earth um, is the fact that there's what we call zodiacal dust or debris disks, dust that's left over from the formation of the planetary system given off by comets from the collisions of asteroids and this debris disk is both a signpost that there may be planets present. This is a Hubble image of the disk around the star Fomalhaut and if you look very closely, observers were able to go in and make multiple images of this disk around Fomalhaut and that little white square marks off a place where on subsequent images in 2004 and 2006, um, they found an object that was moving in common with the motion of the star Fomalhaut itself and the belief is it is a planet in orbit around this star just going along the inside of this, uh, of this debris disk. And one of the challenges for us if we eventually want to image an Earth itself is that dust in fact as you see here reflects light, it both reflects it and emits thermal radiation that can mask the presence of a planet. So if you want to try and think of an analogy for what it's like to try and observe an Earth next to a bright star a few tens of light years away. Think about a lighthouse and how stars are a billion times brighter than this little firefly that's up in the corner up by the uh, light inside the lighthouse. So you have to block out the light of the lighthouse and of course the lighthouse is on the east coast, Cape Hatteras, we're out here on the west coast or in Hawaii trying to isolate the firefly 
from the, uh, the glare of the searchlight, but then you add this extra problem that the firefly is also hidden in this fog of dust that is associated with the remnants of the formation of the planetary system. So one of the things NASA wanted to do was to quantify how much dust there was around stars like the sun, where eventually we hope to be able to have those as targets for our planet searches. Um, it turns out the glare is a very hard thing to work against if you just try to say, geez, there's a little bit of excess radiation from the dust that's hidden in the glare of the star. So one of the things that NASA really got involved with Keck to do in the first place was to link the two Keck telescopes together and make the equivalent of an 85-meter sized telescope by combining the light from the two telescopes together in what we call an interferometer. And one of the key goals of that was to measure how much of this exozodiacal fog, this dust fog, was surrounding normal stars. And this was an enormous technological challenge. You first had to make the adaptive optics work. That turned out to be easy, as I'm sure Taft will uh, tell you. No real challenge there anymore. But then you had to make two of them work together. And then you had to bring the light beams together in the basement between the two telescopes. And there's just, uh, you know, if any of you, you know, like to go down and, uh, you know, tinker with telescopes and mirrors and things that move back and forth on tracks, you know, at some point if you ever get up to the summit and take a look in the basement, it's a remarkable technological achievement to bring the light beams down from the two telescopes and combine them with an accuracy of a few ten fractions of a micron to combine the light from the two telescopes and look for evidence of the, uh, the dust around these other stars, in addition to observations of a variety of other astronomical objects with this very high angular resolution that you can achieve with the equivalent of an 85-meter telescope. And you can just sort of see all the apparatus that's down there. And you block out the light of the star shown at the center, you combine the light from the interferometer in such a way that there, there's a null at that position. The starlight has disappeared, and the, any light from the fog that's around that star can shine through, and you can measure it. And we did that for something like 25 up to, on different levels of accuracy, but certainly about 25 stars. And Keck was able to improve on the results from the Spitzer Space Telescope, which had previously set the best limits, from something like a thousand times the light you know, that, that we have in our own solar system, the exozodiacal light. So on the top, that's what the exozodiacal light would look like in a system that has a lot of this, this asteroid debris and cometary debris. This was measured by Spitzer on the top, and that's roughly a thousand times what we have on our own solar system. And you can see on a very dark night, you know, from Mauna Kea, but better from Haleapahaku where there's more oxygen and for your night vision, you can see the glow of the exozodiacal, or the local zodiacal light on a good dark night, not associated with the Milky Way, but just shown as a pale band of light. And that starlight, sunlight, reflecting off the dust in our own solar system, bouncing to our eyes. If you were in this other star system, HD 69830, which we found with Spitzer, that would be a thousand times brighter and actually be brighter than the Milky Way. And that, a system such as that would be very hard to find on Earth um, because it would just be lost in that fog. Well, Keck was able to drop the, the measurements down by probably a factor of 10 or more compared to Spitzer and made a real contribution to our understanding that we'll probably be able eventually to build telescopes in space to be able to image Earth-like systems, that this problem of this fog, this debris from the asteroids and comets won't be insurmountable. That's still an ongoing um, search using other telescopes on the ground, um, now that the Keck interferometer has done what it can do, and also eventually telescopes in space. Um, so in addition to looking at other solar systems, other planetary systems, of course, of course Keck works 
to study objects in our own solar system as well. As I mentioned at the beginning, it was the planetary division of NASA which first supported the Keck Observatory um, in building the second Keck. So we spend quite a lot of our time looking at objects inside our own solar system. And I'll just give you a snippet of what some of those are. And in many cases, they're in direct support of uh, ongoing spacecraft that are visiting uh, those particular planetary bodies. So right now, starting in at Mercury, Mercury Messenger is exploring the surface of Mercury. They recently finished a map of 100 percent of the surface of Mercury with really quite remarkable resolution. Um, you can see the, the map here. It's available on the web. Um, but Keck has been monitoring Mercury for almost a decade and it's been finding thing, gases that are given off by high energy particles that impact the surface. You can then study the things that are evolved off the surface of Mercury. And that laid the groundwork for many of the observations that MESSENGER undertook when it actually got there. And MESSENGER has been doing a fabulous job mapping out Mercury, even finding evidence for ice in the deep craters at the North Pole, uh, what is obviously the hottest planet in our own solar system. But Keck has been playing a role helping to characterize what's, what the surface is made out of. Um, some of you may remember the movie Deep Impact that came out in 1998. Some of you may remember last winter this dramatic comet that, or comet or asteroid, people are still debating, that nearly uh, landed, you know, it did land in Russia, but fortunately not in an inhabited place. And one of the things that NASA is very interested in are the properties of near-Earth objects. These are asteroids, typically quite small, that are orbiting in and around the vicinity of the Earth. And people certainly debate the numbers, but you know, it is certainly the case that sometime in the next 50 million years, Earth will get hit by some sort of an asteroid or a comet, and it might or might not be one of these near-Earth objects. Congress has given NASA a mandate to find and study these objects. Um, not that Congress could do anything <laughs> about it, <laughs> even if they knew it was coming. But you know, at least we're getting a catalog of that. So Keck has been used in this way to study these objects, resolving them with adaptive optics. We can actually measure the size of one of these things. And then in a different experiment, Bill Merlin actually showed that uh, one of these actually had a its own little moon. So it was resolved at the few under a tenth of an arc second scale, so about three kilometers apart. And these things are just orbiting each other as they zip by the Earth at a, in this case, very safe distance. So Keck has been involved in studying these objects very closely. Fortunately, none of them have had uh, anything like the drama associated either with the movie or with the uh, webcam images shown there. Um, is there life on Mars? Mars is the most likely place in our solar system where there might be life beyond the Earth. Um, it's got a good temperature. It has water. It's a bit cold now. Might have been warmer in the past. And there's been a lot of work over many, many years to study the Martian atmosphere, first remotely, and now, of course, with the various Mars landers. But in between the missions to Mars, um, Keck has been used, as has the NASA IRTF telescope, also on Mauna Kea, to look at the atmosphere. And back in, uh, oh, must be almost a decade now, maybe going back to 2003, uh, Mike Mooma and his collaborators found evidence for uh, methane. And methane's a, an atmospheric species. It's pretty hard to understand. Um, I mean, life is certainly one of the possible explanations. Volcanism is another. But the fact that it's time varying uh, made people certainly stand up and take notice. Um, and it certainly affected the design and the experiments and the landing areas for uh, the Curiosity mission and planning for future instrumentation. And there's been coordinated observations between the Mars Express mission, along with Keck, RTF, Subaru, 
and other telescopes. And one of the landing zones for Curiosity is in one of those uh, boxes over there. So then there's been a direct influence of the observations made for Mauna Kea with Keck and RTF on the planning for one of the Mars landers. And I'm going to report tonight that we now understand where the methane went on Mars. With the laser spectrometer taking care of the production of methane here with this cat. Um, if you move out in the solar system, the, you know, the various moons of Jupiter and Saturn are very interesting objects. They're much colder than anything that we'd think of as an obvious venue for life. But Europa, for example, is thought to have a deep ocean under perhaps 10 kilometers of ice at the surface. But there is thought to be, on pretty good evidence, an ocean there. If you have water, if you have chemistry, you have some sort of energy, tidal energy, you could have life. So Keck has been used by Mike Brown and his colleagues to make adaptive optics spectral maps of the surface of Europa, finding various salts and other minerals on the surface that might either have been extruded up from the ocean or generated through radioactive processes at the surface and might go down into the ocean and perhaps form a basis of chemistry that might become interesting enough to be a basis for life on the time scales of billions of years. Um, much still to be discovered by that and there's certainly hopes eventually for a NASA probe that would go to Europa. And if that were to happen, I'm sure Keck would be deeply involved in trying to figure out where the right places for that to land might be. Um, even though Keck and Mike Brown helped to kill Pluto as a planet, demoting it to a, uh, a dwarf planet or something like that, it turns out NASA had already sent a spacecraft out to visit Pluto back when it was a planet and worthy of being having a spacecraft sent to it. Still worth it. Alan Stern, who's the principal investigator of New Horizons, still calls it a planet. We had a debate at the American Astronomical Society meeting a couple of years ago with Mike Brown on one hand and, and I guess it was, also, it was Neil Tyson and Alan Stern debating whether or not it was uh, a planet or not. In the end, I was also speaking, I just decided let's just go and visit it and characterize it. It doesn't really matter much what you call it. So Keck has been supporting these observations in this mission in the following way. One of the things the New Horizons team is worried about is they're hurtling through the Pluto system when they get there in a couple of years at 14 kilometers per second. And we now know that there's a couple of moons around Pluto and a little dust ring. So if they were to hit a particle of dust at 14 kilometers per second, that would really ruin their day. Not only that, it takes them about a year to send their data from the encounter back to Earth because the distances are so great that they just don't have a very high uh, data rate. If you remember your 300 baud modems, that's sort of what they have. And so, t so they really do want to survive their encounter and depending on what they find in terms of moons or rings, using both Keck Adaptive Optics and Hubble, they may change their trajectory in and out to try and make sure that they have a safe passage but still close enough to be very interesting. And after they go beyond um, Pluto, they're looking now for targets that they could go to to find another Kuiper Belt object that they could rendezvous with, you know, some five or ten years from now. So there's a collaboration between Keck and the Subaru telescope where we're able to use Subaru's very wide field camera, look for Kuiper Belt objects that uh, Keck would then characterize and those in principle could become new mission targets for new, the New Horizons spacecraft after its uh, encounter with Pluto. And then the last solar system thing I'll discuss is for those of you, you know, who'll be here in the late fall and early winter, um, there's a very, which promises to be a very bright comet that will, should be very prominent in the evening and then morning sky. It may even be a daylight bright object. It's quite a large comet. It'll go to just four times the radius of the sun and orbit and zip around the sun and if it survives, go back out again. And Keck will be used with its spectrometers to study 
a lot of the molecules that get evolved off from the, in the coma of the comet. This is a Hubble picture taken when the comet's still quite far out. But this is just a map of the sky, not from Hawaii, from a more northern site. It'll be higher up in the, in the sky as seen from Hawaii. But somewhere around November to December, it should be a very, very bright uh, comet, Comet Ison. And uh, Taft and the observatory have been very accommodating to make sure that this gets observed very, very well since it's of great interest to the NASA community to follow up on this. So these are some of the direct support that NASA's given to planetary missions, but the, all the scientific astronomical missions have benefited enormously from, from Keck. One of the things NASA's done in the infrared that I've been involved with are these all-sky surveys particularly at infrared wavelengths where you get great sensitivity by getting above the Earth's atmosphere. Um, Taft mentioned the IRAS mission that was launched in the uh, early 80s. Um, it was the first really sensitive all-sky survey. There's sort of a map of it here. You can see the band of the Milky Way going across the center and that blue band that sort of makes this look like a Fabergé egg on its side is the band of the zodiacal emission in our own solar system, the glowing dust in our own solar system. Well, IRS found about a quarter of a million infrared objects, many of which needed to be followed up to understand what they were. And uh, Tom Sofer, Gary Neugebauer, many of the people at Caltech spent many of the first nights on Keck trying to follow up these uh, objects found with IRAS. Um, Twenty-some years later, NASA launched another mission called the WISE mission, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Exper Explorer. And uh, it had much more sensitive detectors, um, even though the telescope was actually a little bit smaller, and in increased the number of objects that it found in the infrared compared to IRAS by quite a bit. Um, the precise number is 500 million, 63 million, and so on. A lot of objects, half a billion sources. Luckily, computers have, uh, have kept up, and we can now actually search these databases and find the interesting objects that reveal something exciting about uh, the universe. WISE was meant to do find the nearest uh, stars to the Earth, the nearest cold infrared brown dwarf stars to the Earth, and some of the most distant um, galaxies in the process of formation or collision. And Keck has been used to investigate both of those extremes. I'll talk about one of those goals that I've been involved with, along with uh, collaborators at, at Caltech and elsewhere, the search for what we call brown dwarf stars using the WISE satellite. If you look up at the image here, you see the sun, quite a large object. You know, we say that it has one solar mass and one solar radius. As you go down to get smaller and smaller stars, you get low mass stars. We call those M stars. They're cooler. They have a smaller radius. They have a lower mass, maybe down to a tenth of the mass of the sun before they stop being able to have thermonuclear reactions. They still keep going. The process of making stars through this gravitational fragmentation continues and make, it doesn't know that it's making a ball of gas that doesn't necessarily produce uh, fusion energy, but you can get a brown dwarf star that's under about uh, a tenth of a solar mass, maybe 70 times the mass of Jupiter. Then you get down to the planetary scale, you have Jupiters and eventually, of course, then something as small as the Earth. And we have two different ways, as I mentioned earlier, of forming objects. You can make things from the collapse of molecular clouds. You go, you make something the size of the sun, you make something the size of an M star, you make something the size of a brown dwarf, but eventually that process comes to an end and you just can't get material to hang together long enough to produce a star. From the bottom up, you make rocky cores and a disk of a newly formed star. You make an Earth, it accretes material. You make a Jupiter, you make a couple of times the mass of Jupiter, and that's the core accretion. Where does star formation end? At the small scale. Where does planet formation end? At the large scale. 
somewhere around the Brown Dwarf regime is the end of the star formation process. And what we've been finding with Wise are these very, very cool brown dwarfs that straddle this range between a few times the mass of Jupiter and uh, larger brown dwarfs. So we set up the WISE satellite to look at a number of different wavelengths very exactly. These are three of the bands that WISE looked at. And if you look at a typical brown dwarf, where it's green in there, the brown dwarf emits a lot of radiation, not so much at the other two wavelengths. So if you look at a variety of different objects found by WISE, you see these ones that appear in these false color images to be green. They're giving off a lot of radiation in this four to five micron regime where we're able to uh, detect them pretty easily. So we need to follow up on them with Keck. We take spectra with the NERSPEC instrument or eventually now with uh, MOSFIRE. We can characterize those emission peaks. We get that the temperature of the objects might be Surprisingly, for something that you think you might call a star, it's room temperature. It's 300 Kelvin. Um, and its mass might be only two to ten times the mass of Jupiter. So we're using Keck plus the WISE data plus theoretical models to, uh, to study these objects. In some cases, they're binary systems and we can get their masses directly. We're using Keck in conjunction with the other space telescopes, Spitzer and Hubble, to follow the motions of the star down here at the bottom. You can see this wobbly motion. This is a brown dwarf that's quite close. It's only about five or six uh, parsecs, maybe 18 to 20 light years away. And it's got a proper motion that takes it across the sky. But there's also a parallax effect as we observe it from one side of the Earth's orbit to the other that makes it look like it's wobbling back and forth. From the amplitude of that motion, we can get the distance very precisely. So Keck is absolutely critical in helping to characterize these failed stars and understand that in the end, we're really running out of the star formation process. This plot just shows the number of stellar objects within about uh, 25 light years. There's a small number of G stars like our own sun, more K stars, a lot of M stars, and then these brown dwarfs, there are just not very many of them. We've reached the end of star formation. Then there's sort of a desert, and then planet formation comes up, but of course those objects tend to be captured around their host stars. So the other extreme, as I mentioned, is not the nearest objects, but the most distant objects. And this is where the perhaps most dramatic collaboration has occurred between Keck, and NASA missions, in particular the Hubble Space Telescope. In 1995, after Hubble was recently repaired with its new instrumentation, it stared at one small piece of sky for 10 days continuously, something called the Hubble Deep Field. And it's a very small region, something the size of a small lunar crater. Um, and it just went in and studied to see what was there in what would otherwise be called a blank field of sky. And it found thousands of galaxies of all different sizes, shapes, and colors, but these were all pretty indistinct, small, fuzzy things. And it was Keck that came along and was immediately able to make its spectroscopic observations, getting hundreds of what we call the redshifts that give you the distances to the objects and some idea of the physical conditions. And the result of that was an understanding that star formation in these galaxies peaked about a time, um, a look back time of uh, a billion years, a few billion years. There was a peak in star formation when galaxies were colliding and, for and really forming the stars that we now see. And that happened at a certain time, uh, quite unique time, and then faded off again. And just within three or four years of the first light of Keck and of Hubble, the combination of those two facilities really changed extragalactic astronomy forever. Before Keck we were, and Hubble, you know, we had galaxies at redshifts of a few tenths and we'd try and understand when the stars were formed, how the galaxies achieved their shape and their content with the combination of Hubble imaging and Keck spectroscopy, 
we really began to understand that in a very profound way. And so the next question is, when did the first galaxies form? And for that, there's a little timeline that was in a recent paper by uh, Richard Ellis and his collaborators from Caltech. And I won't go through it in any detail, but on the far side, you know, this is a timeline. So on the far side, you have the Big Bang. Um, then some magic occurs. Um, you see the, um, the period where everything is very heavily ionized. That's the period when we now study that fossil radiation of the cosmic microwave background with the COBE mission, the WMAP mission, the Planck mission. And then everything goes dark. The uh, hydrogen um, recombines, the universe um, becomes, there's dark matter, galaxies start to form around that. And somewhere around a few hundred million years, you now start to get collapse around these pockets of dark matter. The first stars form. The first galaxies start to coalesce. And these are what we call redshifts of maybe 10 or something like that. These are a few hundred million years after the Big Bang are the very first galaxies. As we continue to move um, towards me, the universe starts to become reionized and transparent. You start to see these galaxies starting to form. And so the galaxies we're now seeing with Keck and with Hubble are sort of redshifts of six. And those are now recognizable galaxies. They're very faint. Hubble has you know, started to observe them. Spitzer has started to observe them. Um, these are galaxies that have ages less than a billion years. And they presumably formed back in this sort of middle period in the timeline. Keck is able to get a spectrum that shows this particular small fuzzy thing in a Hubble image has this distant, uh, this distant redshift. If it didn't have the Keck spectrum, you'd be very hard pressed to be able to characterize this object. But now we're moving even further back in time, very, very, very deep Hubble images moving now into the near-infrared bands of the new uh, camera on um, Hubble, are revealing objects that perhaps have redshifts of 10 or 11. These are perhaps really the first newly forming galaxies. We don't yet have redshifts and precise characterizations. Maybe they're a false positive, a relatively nearby galaxy that's masquerading as a more distant one. Keck is still working to get spectra of some of these objects using the new MOSFIRE instrument. And I talked to Richard Ellis over, uh, over the weekend to try and say, have you succeeded yet? And he said, no, the weather's been lousy. But they're all working very hard to try and get spectra of these objects and see, are these really some of the first forming galaxies? Um, so what is NASA going to do as its next step to try and, and study that. Let me do one other thing first. One other thing that NASA and Keck have worked together on very, very well is to take advantage of space's ability to find some interesting object um, or on the ground, but have Keck immediately turn its telescope, turn its uh, instruments onto some interesting object within a few hours of its discovery. So gamma ray bursts were seen from space, and these are some of the most powerful explosions known about, and it was really Keck responding to notifications from space satellites that some gamma ray burst had gone off, and that the space satellite had also found an X-ray glow, and that was with a positional accuracy sufficient to let Keck point at an object where the gamma ray burst had gone off and demonstrate that these were taking places in very distant galaxies. And we now understand that these are some of the most energetic explosions in the entire cosmos. And again, Keck was critical to following up on the space observations. And of course, in the last couple of years, Keck and Hubble have been engaged in a very friendly collaboration and competition to study supernovae and use that information to study the expansion of the universe and in turn use that to discover what's called dark energy. And those observations, lead, those observations recently led to uh, a Nobel Prize uh, for some of the observations made at Keck. And I'm sure you've had talks about that um, 
from previous speakers. So what's coming up next? Well, NASA's next big step is the James Webb Space Telescope, and it's really being designed to answer one question. Where are these first light objects, the first stars that turn on, the very first galaxy turning on in what's called the dark ages between all the stars and galaxies we see now and this period where all the gas is just sitting there passively and there is no star formation ongoing. And NASA's instrument to solve this question is something called the James Webb Space Telescope, shown here. It's an infrared telescope considerably larger than, than Hubble. Hubble's two and a half meters, shown here. Here's the James Webb Space Telescope primary mirror, six and a half meters. And of course, here's Keck at 10 meters. But you'll notice quite a few similarities. James Webb, like Keck, is a uh, segmented telescope. The fabrication of of Keck, you saw some of the pictures in the beginning uh, movie, the Star Trek, Starstruck movie that uh, Taft showed at the beginning of the evening with hundreds of people scurrying around the summit putting together this telescope. James Webb has no luxury of having a lot of people. It just has to get launched, survive the equivalent of a truck crash, and <laughs> deploy itself and work perfectly right out of the box. There's a reason it costs a lot of money. Um, replacing all those people who worked so many years to make uh, Keck a success and just have this thing just work, as you see here, is an enormous challenge. JWST is supposed to, uh, to go up and deploy, launch and deploy somewhere around 2017, 2018, and it will really be a dramatic step forward and I'm sure we'll find ways to have synergies between James Webb and Keck when the time comes. I should mention that part of the design for James Webb, also a segmented telescope, was validated here at Keck. They conducted an experiment where they moved the segments of Keck in and out of position and used the techniques they eventually want to use on orbit to move the each of the individual segments up and down in what we call piston, sense that with the techniques they want to use on James Webb, and get all the segments into the right position. And as you can see, there's the before, there's the after, using what exactly the technology they wanted to use for James Webb. And this experiment at Keck done over a couple of years was really critical to na building NASA's confidence that the techniques they wanted to use in space would in fact um, work, as Keck, of course, was the premier large segmented telescope, and if they could make it work there, that really added to their confidence. So Keck has played very well with all the NASA missions. This is just a chart that shows the number of papers in the refereed journals that combine Keck with one of these various NASA missions. The biggest one is Hubble. It's been up for a long time. It grew up, if you will, with Keck. And so there are almost 500 papers in the refereed literature of Keck with a galaxy, Keck with a young star in the process of formation, Keck and Hubble on almost any topic in astronomy you care to think of. Then Spitzer, the Chandra X-ray telescope, the combination of Hubble and Spitzer and Chandra and Keck, and then a long suite of other missions, um, all of which had key data supporting them coming from the Keck telescopes. So this is just a few of the spacecraft that Keck has worked in conjunction with, X-ray telescopes, infrared telescopes, um, Hubble, Kepler, IRAS, WISE, uh, deep impact, various planetary probes, all sorts of telescopes in the future, James Webb, maybe some terrestrial planet finder someday in the future taking advantage of the knowledge of the debris disks that uh, the interferometer helped to find. And there are other ones that I just didn't have room to put on here. So it's been a very fruitful collaboration. Um, we look forward to a continuation of this beautiful friendship over many years. NASA has 
renewed its five-year agreement with Keck for another five years. There's a Kepler Key Science program ongoing to characterize, confirm and characterize candidate planets. There's a campaign that will happen in the fall to study comet ISON. Um, new instrumentation, instrument upgrades will support and complement NASA's goals up to and including James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chaz, for that wonderful unification of astronomy from here on the ground and from space.